What is up, everybody, and how's it going? I'm Alex Goldstick, and you are listening to the Spring Forward Podcast. Spring is officially here. Quarterbacks and receivers reported to Austin on Wednesday, with the rest of the league checking in on Thursday. Practice is underway as we speak to get set for the league's first set of games on April 7th. While practices are not open to the public, tickets for the two games for each team that make up the league are on sale now on thespringleague.com. On today's episode, we talk to Marvin Bracey, a Florida State alum who sprinted for the United States at the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio. Our interview was recorded on Wednesday after Marvin's first day of Spring League practice. Let's get right to it. Marvin Bracey is an Orlando native who might be better known for his track career than his football one, which is still fairly young. The wide receiver attended Florida State, but didn't actually play a game while in Tallahassee, instead concentrating on his sprinting, which ultimately paid off with a trip to the 2016 Summer Olympics in Brazil with Team USA. Marvin returned to Florida State for his pro day last offseason, and after going undrafted, spent part of the preseason with the Colts. He's on the ground in Austin now to keep his football dreams alive at the Spring League. Marvin, welcome to Spring Forward. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Definitely glad to be here. You literally just got through your first day of scheduling, maybe not even through your first day of scheduling in Austin. Uh, wide receivers and quarterbacks arrive a day earlier than the rest of the league, and we're recording this on Wednesday. Um, what are your initial impressions of the Spring League, just from check-in? Um, it's definitely uh, well ran. Um, they do a good job of uh, running a tight ship, and you know they've done the best to accommodate everybody and to get us in, to get us acclimated, and to just get us ready to get rolling. So part of check-ins, receiving your helmet, receiving your equipment. Um, are you excited to get those pads and helmets back on? When was the last time you actually geared up for a, a full um, contact football game? The last game? time I was actually geared up was uh, August 31st. That was my last preseason game uh, in Indianapolis. And I'm definitely excited to uh, to get it back on, to get it going, man. Um, you know, I, I mean, I obviously missed out, you know, on this season. You know, I, I didn't get, uh, went out unsigned. But I'm definitely looking to change that. So... Focusing on, on your on your track and Olympic career for a second, there have been 37 former NFL players who have competed in the Summer Olympics. Um, that 37 represents the players that have made active NFL rosters, so you're not actually among them yet, but you will be. Um, oh, but, absolutely. <laughs> but that's not an insignificant number. 31 of the 37 competed in track and field like you. Um, some of the more notable names include Jim Thorpe and Bob Hayes. Uh, Tommy yeah. Smith, who has one of the most iconic moments in American yeah. Olympic history, played a year in the NFL. Uh, former Lions running back of recent memory, Javed Best, competed in the same events as you in Brazil, but representing St. Mm-hmm. Lucia. Um, and he's the only person on this whole list to compete in the Olympics after his NFL career. Um, so obviously with the muscle and weight it takes to play football, it's difficult to be a sprinter and a football player at the same time. Um, right. And so a lot of Spring League guys that I've talked to had very successful track careers in high school while they played football. But lend us some insight into the mind of someone who is at an elite level in two different sports. Oh man, um, you know, weight obviously is a is a big issue for um for a lot of people cuz uh what you don't want to do is you don't want to, you know, gain a bunch of weight to play football and then lose a bunch of weight to play to to run track. And luckily for, you know, for people like me, um that's coming into the game, you know, nowadays it's, you know, it's a little different than, you know, when people play back in the days where like you might want to be, you know, 220, 230 playing running back, you know, taking those beatings. But nowadays, like I said, it's, a, it's you know it's a lot it's a lot uh, a lot less you know intense on your body. So I can come in and not have to be. I can come in, you know, at a at a decent weight around 180, you know, 185, 170, somewhere up in that range, and and you know have a successful career and be just fine and not have to you know put on weight because you know ultimately that slows you down. So we mentioned that you went to the the Olympics in Brazil and and competed fairly well. I'm sure you've answered a million and one questions about your Olympic experience, but if you can sum it up in a few sentences, uh, what was it like to represent your country, especially as a football player? Um, because it's a sport so specific to the United States that people in your position rarely get a chance at international competition in the football realm. Man, um, it was probably the biggest blessing I think I received uh, so far. It was. It still is surreal to me, you know, that I got to do that because a lot of people don't know that um, I actually had a. I, I I didn't know at the time, but I needed a hernia surgery, and I was actually taking a. I had a few cortisone shots throughout the season just so I could be able to train, and um, you know, I was able to get through trials and you know make the team. I came out with a third place finish. I mean, but you know, top three makes the team, and you know, just to even be there, man, was a blessing because I only ran what, four, five races the entire year. 
you know, including the Olympics. So, you know, just to be there and to represent my country, uh, that was really big, you know, represent my family, you know, and yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, so there's a lot of rumors and rumblings about the goings on at Olympic villages and whatnot. Uh, well, what's it like in, in the PG version, uh, living for two weeks with some of the best athletes in the world? <laughs> Man, listen, I, I had, I had, it was an unbelievable experience. Um, you know, we had food from all over the world, um, you know, at our fingertips, but yet I was consumed by McDonald's, which was, you know, actually free. Um, you know, lines was always long, but you know, that, that's where I spent a lot of my time. And also, but I see, luckily for me, I trained in a group that had international athletes. So I was able to hang out with some of my Jamaican friends, my Trinidadian friends, my Bahamian friends, you know, stuff like that. And it was, like I said, man, it was still, it was such a surreal moment to just, to just be amongst, you know, some of the world's greatest athletes. One of whom is actually Usain Bolt, who I don't know if you saw, but he spent, I think, a week in, in Germany with Dortmund playing soccer. So maybe he just got the inspiration from you to go to go try a different sport out for a second. I mean, I, th- I, I'm, I, mean, I actually uh, I got a chance to watch his documentary, and I, mean, I saw that you know he's a he's a big soccer fan, a soccer fan, and I have no doubt in my mind that if he really wanted to to do that, I'm pretty sure he would be able to. Uh, that guy's really blessed. So you've got a, a sub ten second hundred meter dash to your name. In June twenty fifteen you ran the hundred meters in nine point nine three seconds in the UK, mm-hmm. which is your personal best. Um, you know, while there aren't many in the world that can do it, the hundred meter dash is one of the most straightforward athletic competitions in the world and is often used to label the world's fastest athletes. You know, right. describe what that feeling is like being that fast. Like objectively, you're fast. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, believe it or not, it doesn't feel fast. Uh when I ran that day um, I actually had ran a prelim round about an hour and a half before, and I ran 997. And it felt like the easiest race I had ever ran, not as far as like competition level, but just as far as execution, man. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, you don't even like you're running that fast. And I'm telling them, like, that's what it's supposed to look like. When you see those guys whose veins are popping out of their necks and their head is snapped back and they're just, you know, grinning and just trying to grit it out, um, that, that, those are the people, you know, running the slowest and having the hardest time getting down the track or field or whatever the surface they're running on. But when you see guys that just glide down the runway, man, it, it makes it look effortless. That's when those guys, that's how you know those guys are really, really, really running. Bring it back to football for a second. You know, in football, sprinting and speed is judged a little bit differently. You can run the 100 in under 10 seconds, but what's your 40 time? My fastest 40 ever recorded, I ran a 4.22 seconds. I actually did that in high school. Believe it or not, and then I ran in my junior year of high school. I ran 4:32 at the Under Armour Combine, only to be eclipsed by one of my best friends to this day, uh, Mr. Ronald Darby himself. He ran 4:31. So, yeah. And and how do you train for those differently? Is it just the endurance? Oh, and... it's, it's so it's so different, man. Because that grass takes a lot from you, as far as you know, you sinking in the ground with those cleats on, whereas the track. The harder the surface in the track, usually the faster you run. So that's why, you know, people deem indoor facilities a little bit. Indoor facilities, as far as, like, uh, domes and stuff, those surfaces are, like, a lot more faster because they're harder. And they have less uh, – they, they, they have a lot of gear. So, you know, it's, it's it, it really is different. The training is so different. And you just have to, like, really zone in and know, like, your 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 race plan or your running plan is is really different from a technical standpoint and you just have to know you know where you are at the moment because i can't run a 40 yard dash like i run a 60 meter race because it's the distance just it's just everything is different so uh, um, out of the guys of the spring league you're you're taking everyone at the 100 but you think you you could be eclipsed in the 40 oh i don't think so um i I really don't think so uh, unless he just he just Whoever beat me, he's just going to have to bring it. Uh, I'm, I'm a competitor, man, and uh, I, I really don't care what race it is. Like I, I just don't. I don't want to lose. I don't care if it was the 400. All right, I'll, no, I'll be down there. I'll be down there next week in person, so I'll be setting up some bets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your personality as a sprinter and the attitude often associated with wide receivers match up pretty well. Is it is it just speed that attracts sprinters to be receivers, or is there something more deeply rooted that makes the transition from one to the other make more sense? Um, it, it, it makes more sense because as a receiver, you're, you're, I mean, most, I mean, not most of the time, but some of the time, I mean, you get free releases. So you really get to utilize that speed 
Whereas, you know, running backs and people like that, uh, they have to, and fullbacks and stuff, they, they, they're more so power driven because they're breaking tackles and, you know, making cuts on a dime. And I'm obviously receivers got to come in and out of breaks, but, you know, if you just give me a flat out go route or a post route or something like that, like I'm literally like running as fast as I can down the field to get to the ball to make it, you know, easier throw for my quarterback. And, you know, that's my mindset when I have one of those go balls to just separate myself as far as humanly possible. So I feel like it's just more so the speed attracts you to, unless you just so happen to be one of those freakish athletes that are, you know, 6'1", 6'2", even, you know, 5'9", five, 5'8", five, whatever you are, 210 pounds, but you can run, you know, 10'2", 10, 10'1", ten, and 100. Like, that, that, that's, that's a blessing, man. Those guys are that – is, that is moving for guys at 230 pounds coming downhill. Is there something about the spotlight or, or that's, you know, you beating your guy and, you know, in, in track you're it's running? Really, it's, really, and it's also and, – and see, in, I mean, in sprinting, you know, on the track, it, it, like you said, it's, 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 you know, the world's fastest guy. Every guy that runs a 100-meter dash wants to hold that title. Every guy that wants a 100-meter dash just wants to be at the top of the totem pole. And, you know, nowadays, you know, it's a passing league. You know, don't get me wrong, running backs get their shine on, but – it's really, you know, a passing league and it's, you know, they make us out to be the pretty boys and the divas. So it's just kind of the same attitude. You just want to, you know, you be on top and you want to, you know, shine. So moving back to your college career, I'm assuming that as a Floridian, you're forced to pick your college allegiances fairly early in life. Uh, did you always have your eye on FSU? Never, ever. I actually grew up a Miami fan, believe it or not. I grew up a big time Miami fan and my dad actually, and I, I grew up a Miami fan because of my dad. He was like Miami through and through, and he's probably turned in his grave knowing that I went to Florida State. But um, it really was a, uh, and it came, my choices came down to Texas A&M and Florida State from a track standpoint because both of those, obviously, both of those teams, uh, both of those colleges have you know prominent, you know, track, you know, reputations, and you know they've been known to you know. Contend, you know, for national championships, you know, lately, you know, of course they have some struggles, but I do believe, you know, they'll get back to, you know, the old days and um, Texas A&M, obviously they, they're, con- they're contenders to win the, the national championship for track and field every year. And they, they continuously produce uh, great athletes. And I just wanted to be one of those, but I also wanted to be somewhere where I was going to be, you know, able to split up my time evenly, you know, throughout doing track and football, because I mean, doing two sports in college is definitely not an easy task. Well, so you mentioned you're between Florida State and A&M, and that's actually the move that your college coach made. So tell us what it's like to be recruited by a coach like Jimbo Fisher. Man, Jimbo is just straight to the point. Like, I, 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 I love that guy. Uh, he was, he's always, you know, had uh, my best interest at heart. And, you know, he gave me a fair shot. You know, stuff didn't work out the way, you know, well, stuff worked out the way it did. But he gave me a fair shot, and he told me, you know, everything he said, everything he preached to me throughout recruitment, you know, he, he stuck by that. And, you know, I, I, I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. How does recruitment work for two sport athletes? I mean, what kind of permissions do you need to get from various coaches to compete in multiple sports? Um, okay. So with, with track, actually for, uh, for just strictly track guys in college, they usually start training around, I think, uh, around September, like early September. Um, and start, you know, doing grass runs and stuff like that, just kind of building up, you know, conditioning. And then, you know, they're on indoor facility. They're, they're started indoor races in January. So they go out they, and they, they go through what June, July, if you will. Um, and football obviously takes up the entire fall. Bowl game is in January. So, you know, they were able to work out where Jimbo actually told me, he said, Marvin, look, you can do all spring, no spring or some spring. And I actually elected to do no spring. So, I mean, and I mean, he was okay with it because he gave me the choice. You know, it might have been a trick question. I don't know, but, <laughs> you know, I just took track and ran with it. I was like, like I said, I want to evenly divide, you know, my attention to both sports. So in the fall, I am with football. In the spring, I am with track and only track. I'm going to, you know, see this through and continue to do this like this. Looking back just through the lens of, football how do you sum up your college football career because you were certainly at florida state at a the most successful time in recent memory of the program's history man that the time that i spent on campus was, was magical man i learned so much from so many different people within 
you know, a year's time. And, you know, I, I, I regret nothing. Um, you know, I got what I got out of it. And everybody continue, you know, to have a good career. So, you know, like I said, it was it was magical, man. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change nothing. And were you technically part of the team for the the national championship? Actually, no. I had I had left by then, but you know, I was with the team in spirit. I was rooting hard, man. You know, watching from the couch. I actually wanted to go to the game, but um, I was actually training for track like professionally at the time. So I'm, you know, then the game was on Monday night. I go to practice Tuesday, and the, my coach at the time was an Auburn graduate so obviously you know it's a little bit of a hate week type of thing going mm-hmm. on and I come to practice for about a week and a half two weeks playing the FSU fight song just every day just loud for no reason and you know it's just kind of how I do things you'll, you'll definitely run into some, some Auburn guys at the spring league but um oh yeah definitely <laughs> what's the state of your two sport career at the moment are you all in on football or is there any sort of time frame um, you need I'm, success to happen football, man I am all in you know um and I, it was a, it was definitely a hard choice to make. I mean, it was almost as hard as leaving FSU to run track in the first place. It literally was like the same thing. But um, I, I've you know I've had my fun. I've, I've did what I had to do, and you know the ultimate goal was to honestly you know make money and provide for my family and do my best in the sport. And I felt like you know in a little bit of time that I did run, I, I did you know the best that I could do, and I was able to you know provide for me, provide for my family, and but my mind was never like I, I had never. I, I, well, I always knew in the back of my mind that I was going to return to football someday. And, you know, this was the time. You know, I'm 24 years old, and obviously I'm not getting any younger. So, you know, age kind of plays a factor in the NFL unless you're just one of those guys that – unless you're Steve Smith. So, <laughs> you know. Well, if I finally did catch up to him. Yeah. But so, so is there a period at the end of your track career, or is it this is the age that you need to – find out whether you can make it in football or not and and you're always going to be fast i mean you pretty much hit the nail on the head man this is you know right now i'm in prime condition my body is feeling great i am well i won't say as fast as i'll ever be but you know i am at a really i'm at like top speed and i feel like you know the game the way it is now what i can bring to it uh i just feel like that could be electrifying man and you know i could make you know some organization you know really happy to have me and you know, it's just my time to try because, you know, track will always, always be there, man. You know, unless I sustain some, you know, knock on wood, uh, big time injury that would put me out. But for the most part, you know, track, track will always be there, man. I, I won't I'll, I'll be fast for a while. Like you got guys in track and field, you know, running nine seconds at 40 years old. So, you know, I got I still got time. When we when we started talking to you, we we talked about your your time with the Colts. So after going undrafted, you spent a month with Indianapolis during the 2017 preseason. Uh, mm-hmm. What was it like being in a pro cam- in a pro camp after so much time away from the game? Oh man, it was so different. Um, it was so different. Like I, I couldn't even tell you. Like, I, I remember, you know, camp and stuff at FSU. But I mean, my body hadn't been through anything as strenuous. It was hard. I mean, those first three days were really tough. Like the first day, you know, I'm unknown. I'm under the radar. You know, none of the guys really know who I am. So I come in. I run by a couple people, and now you know, I'm starting to make a little name for myself. Um, you know, start to get, you know, try to build familiarity with, you know, some of the, uh, the other receivers and, you know, some of the the, uh, the rookies that were coming in with me as well. And then, you know, towards the end, I, I had learned, you know, most of the system that they installed only for camp. And I was able to play fast, play loose, but it just didn't work out. But, you know, I, I, I have fun, man. And, you know, thanks. A big thank you to the uh, Indianapolis Coach organization for even considering a guy that have, hasn't played football, you know, in five years to even bring me in and give me the opportunity. Well, and, and you made it all the way to final cut. So I think there's something to be said for that, especially for a guy who effectively skipped his, his college football career. Absolutely. And I mean, I, you know, it was, it, I was, and I was talking to my agent about that. He said that to me before. And I'm just, I just told him, I was like, man, you know, in track and field, it's not, it's, it's politics in any sport you play, but well, any sport you play, do whatever. But and track and field, man, it's really about do you have it or not. Like, it's not about, you know, if you can run nine seconds, man, you're going to get into almost every race there is to be ran. Like, maybe you might miss out on one or two, but, you know, if you got it, you got it. And if you don't, you don't. They don't just look at you and say, oh, you haven't ran in. I know you haven't ran in five years, but you're running fast, but, you know, we can't use you. You know, it's just, it, it, and it was okay. And my agent told me, he was like, man, for you to make it through, all the way through training camp, that was huge. And I was just, you know, but I was still stuck on that whole track, you know, if you got it, you got it type of thing. And, um, it, but, you know, as I, as I sit back and reflect on it, I didn't even do, I had a, a hernia surgery 
on May 31st of last year. And I was six weeks out. And that's when Indianapolis gave me the call, like, hey, you know, why don't you come work out for us or whatever. And, I, you know, I aced the workout. And that's when they signed me on the spot. So, you know, for that to even happen, man, that was huge for me because I was in such a bad place once I had the surgery because I missed rookie mini camp. I missed OTAs. I missed, you know, two weeks. I missed a week and a half of training camp. So, you know, to come in and do what I did, you know, I, I got to be proud of myself. From one pro football organization to another, uh, how did you come upon the Spring League and ultimately get accepted to play in it? Um, actually, my agent was the one who uh, who set this all up. Um, he told me about it uh, uh, some months ago and was like, hey, man, this is a great opportunity. I feel like this is a great opportunity for you. Um, you know, you haven't played in a while. They have NFL scouts there to see what you do and, you know, they evaluate. And everything matters, you know, training, uh, uh, practices, uh, meeting room, um, games, like all that stuff matters. So, you know, this is a chance for you to go and show, okay, yeah, I haven't played in a while, but this is what I can do. This is what I bring to the table. And, I mean, I've had ample time to train for this, so I expect to go out here and and be at my best. So you'll be suiting up for for Team East in the Spring League 2018. I believe you're the only Florida State alum this year, but you'll be catching passes from David Olson and Gerard Evans, uh, lining up next to a former NFL talent in Stephen Hill. Uh, Have you looked at the roster or met any of your teammates yet? Um, actually, we just had a we just had a meeting in which all the guys here, you know, Johnny, Gerard, uh, Steven, all those guys were actually in the meeting, and they just kind of went over some basics for the um, for the, the the play calling and how we're gonna uh, how we're gonna do certain things, and you know, just you know, and it's nice to be around those guys, and it's nice to be around you know talented guys that have been at that level because it gives you a, a, a synopsis of where you are, you know, as an athlete or as a receiver, you know, compared to guys that have been there and done what you're trying to do, what, you, what you're trying to do. Besides speed, which we all know you have, what are you looking to prove to the spring league coaches and potential scouts on site while you're in Austin? That I'm, uh, I'm looking to prove that I can, you know, I can run routes, you know, I'm just not, you know, a uh, 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 deep drag slash, you know, big post go route type of guy, you know, I can do, in cutting routes, out breaking routes, like I can, you know, do double moves. Like I'm looking to show them that, you know, I've been working and I'm trying to become a overall receiver, not just a speed receiver, not just a gadget guy. You know, I don't want to come in on, you know, third downs when it's third and eight and we need a deep, you know, I want to come in on first down and be able to make an impact from the time the game starts to the time the game ends. So wrapping up, getting to the end, you're definitely an entertaining follow on Twitter, whether it's live tweeting basketball or random thoughts on fatherhood. Have you found that social media is a generally positive outlet for you? Because that's certainly not uh, been the case for a lot of pro athletes. No, it, it, it always ha- it, it, it has it always has been. Um, you know, obviously, you know, uh, which in today's time, you know, certain subjects can be a little, a little, you know, tricky. But for the most part, I, I, I stay. I try to stay, you know, opinionated and not to cause, you know, controversy. And I just say stuff that applies to me as a person, you know, as a soon-to-be dad as an athlete like I don't you know I don't go on like I, I mean I'm really really careful about you know not going like I'm a, I grew up a Saints fan but I'm not gonna go you know who that nation you know every day of the week like I'll root for them you know they play a game but you know I'm willing there's 32 organizations that I would love to play for and whoever has me you know that's that's where I'm at well I was more referring to your fire takes on Disney movies I don't know if you're just studying up <laughs> on, on being a dad <laughs> <laughs> no nah, I'm, I'm a big Disney fan man uh, I mean I'm only you know people don't believe me but I'm only I'm only 24, so, you know, I grew up on all the Disney movies, and I can't believe somebody would pick Frozen over Tangle. Like, I really, I don't know what's wrong with people. Like, that's that's sick. I'm going to keep you know, my we, thoughts to myself. I'm a little bit older. Yeah. I have, I'm a different generation of Disney, even just five years older. <laughs> but um, before we start our recording, uh, we were talking about your name. I mean, you, you go professionally by Marvin Bracey, but you actually, if people go to your Twitter, they'll see it says Marvin Bracey Williams. So, so right. tell us about your, your name change and, and what's behind that. Um, actually my dad died when I was 10 and for, well, he was in my life. He was a part of my life. And for some reason, my mama decided to give me his first and middle name, but her last name, instead of just making me a junior through and through. So, you know, I told, I always told myself, you know, once I turn 18, I was going to make the switch, but you know, I never, you know, imagined, you know, turning into Marvin Bracey, you know, and a possible NFL athlete and Olympian. Like I didn't know that that was my future. So I made my name as Marvin Bracey. So, I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my name and just, you know, hyphenate it and make myself the, his junior. And then also, you know, I have a son coming. He'll be here uh, uh, late May. And I always wanted, you know, he was going to be my junior, but now he will be the third. 
All right. Well, I, I think that's a, a amazing place to end it. Uh, you know, spring is here. You're on the ground. You'll uh, this will probably come out on Friday, but uh, you'll be two three days into your spring league experience, and uh, we hope there's a lot of eyes on you. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. I definitely appreciate the opportunity and look forward to speaking with you in the future. All right. That brings us to the end of Episode 7 of Spring Forward. Thanks to Marvin for calling in and best of luck to him as he pursues his football dreams. If you want to catch all of his Twitter takes, you can find him at underscore brace yourself. Tickets for the Spring League are now on sale at thespringleague.com. Also, as was announced earlier this week, all Spring League games will be streamed for free on BR Live, Bleacher Report's new streaming platform. The Spring League games on April 7th will be the first live event streamed on the platform. You can follow real-time updates from the Spring League on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the Spring League. You can follow me on Twitter at AGStick and on Instagram at ThisIsMyOtherIG. All music in this episode was provided to Spring Forward by Joshua Rosner. We'll be live with new episodes from the Spring League in Austin next week. Later. Thank you.